you. Okay, <laughs> just kidding. Uh, <laughs> welcome to WinShape Teams and our discussion on emotional intelligence and coaching. Uh, my name is Teddy Sanders. I'm one of the client relationship coordinators here at uh, WinShape Teams, and I'm joined by Dr. Chris Auger and Mr. Jesse Parrish. Uh, so today what we're going to be doing is we're going to be speaking a little bit more about what is coaching, uh, why is it important, and um, why is emotional intelligence key to that. Now, uh, we had this plan several weeks ago and we wanted to go through with it, but we also wanted to recognize that uh, life has changed a lot for folks in the last week or so. Uh, we recognize that people are hurting and we recognize that we don't understand it. You are looking at three middle-aged white men up on a stage right now. And we just want to say that we are in a position where we want to listen, to know, and to hear, to understand. And so we want to be able to do that to be the best advocates for change uh, moving forward. So, um, Jesse, why don't you tell us a little bit more about who we are at Winchick Teams? Yeah, yeah, Teddy, I appreciate that. And just again to echo, man, it's really our desire to, to seek to understand and, and use this idea of emotional intelligence as a tool in order to do that. So today really is a conversation between us on what does that look like and, and how do we approach that. So for WinShape Teams as a whole, we've been an organization that's existed since 1991 uh, as a team and leadership development organization. We started out uh, primarily experiential learning, so the challenge course, zip line, that kind of world. And, and we use that tool of experiential learning to pair it with this idea of, of development, uh, helping someone learn, see, and understand what leadership is and how to team better. And so over the years, we've had a lot of opportunities to grow and mature in that to where today I'd say, man, we, we do an excellent job of pairing meaningful content primarily around servant leadership, teamsmanship, and followership, and engaging interactive experiences. We put those two things together and provide a great transformational platform, I think, to address people's beliefs, their attitudes or mindsets, and the behaviors that they have as leaders, team members, and followers. And so that's a little bit of what we do is create that space for transformation. Awesome. Well, before we get into hearing a little bit more about y'all's stories, uh, we have a live chat going on. Uh, so why don't you say hello, let us know where you're uh, hailing from right now. And then also, if you have any questions that come up, go ahead and put that into the feed and we'll get into that uh, near the end of our conversation. So that being said, Dr. Chris Auger, I'm going to call you Chris. Is that okay? Yeah, please. Okay. I appreciate that. And formality, I appreciate it. Um, tell me a little bit more about what brought you to WinShape Teams and just a little bit more about your story. Okay. Uh, a little bit about my story. I spent almost 28 years in the Navy SEAL teams. Uh, but 1987, I left college and was going to let the Navy pay for it. And then took the test to get into the SEALs and passed and went through the program and made it through the program and then just fell in love with being in the SEAL teams. I love the small team environment. That's anything from you yourself and two people or all the way up to a couple few hundred people, which kind of, that's the breadth of my career there. At the back end of my career, uh, unfortunately, I put about eight lifetimes on my spine, according to my spinal surgeon. And after a couple of surgeries, he suggested I find a different occupation because doing what I was doing was not safe anymore. So I said, okay, I'll retire. And as I headed into retirement, I looked at my bride and said, I'm going to have so much time on my hands. And she said, I'm not going to be your hobby in retirement. And I went, okay, well then I'll go back to school. I already had a master's, so I was going to shoot for a doctorate. And she, knowing how OCD I am about grades, she kind of said, I don't want you to go back to school. And I go, well, then you get to be my hobby. And she said, yeah, go back to school. So <laughs> I went back to school and, uh, at Regent University in Virginia Beach, Virginia, and pursued a doctorate in strategic leadership with a concentration in leadership coaching, which coupled the board certification I have in coaching that I obtained in the final years of my military career. And we'll talk more about how I got into coaching a little bit later on, but we went back to Virginia Beach from San Diego and it was a great move, uh, four days without the radio, just me and my bride, and we did that intentionally and it was just surprisingly awesome. And uh, then my daughter came cross country and she fell in love with a gentleman in Georgia, which mom basically said, hey, how come she gets two and I get none? So it turned into, hey, let's go find a house in Georgia so we can be next to those future grandkids. Mm -hmm. Getting through the school, my wife looked at me and said, is it about time for you to start looking for a job? 
with all the schooling you're getting? And I said, okay, I'll look at Chick-fil-A. And moving through a Chick-fil-A uh, process of going for one of their positions prepared me for the position here at Winshape Teams. Summer of 2017, I was recruited to come to Winshape Teams, and I went through the very uh, uh, laborious or extensive process of interviewing for the position, and it worked out to my favor. Unfortunate for the other person, but great for me. And I started working here at Winshape Teams in 2017, and uh, it's been just a wonderful experience ever since. I appreciate the word usage of uh, extensive rather than arduous. Uh, very political. <laughs> uh, Jesse, tell us a little bit about yourself and why uh, you were a Clemson fan before they got good. Oh, Clemson. Oh, you're yeah. going there. Straight oh, yeah, sure. Okay. Why not? All right. Well, I married into the Clemson family. So okay. they won me over. And I, I will have to say uh, the first time that I met my in-laws was at a Boston College Clemson game. And I cheered for Boston College. I oh. definitely ingratiated myself into the family there. So, yeah. uh, but no, they, this was pre Dabo though, right? Yeah, Terry Bowden, very beginning, very okay. beginning of Dabo. So they won me over, um, and uh, my wife and I have been happily married for the past uh, ten years. Have a five-year-old son named Noah, uh, who is just—he's getting to that age where, man, hiking and fishing and bike rides and having those little father-son dad conversations are, are really starting to happen. So. It's just a, a blast to be a, a, a husband and a, and a father at this moment in time. So I, I've been a part of the Windshape family for about 10 years, um, uh, 10 years now. So started at the retreat center that we have here, carrying luggage, and always looked down at Windshape teams and went, oh, that looks fun. The challenge course that they had, the team and leadership development, uh, and really desired to be a part of that. Um, took a little detour before I started with teams. Got a master's degree in professional counseling and spent about six years as a licensed therapist. Uh, worked in a psychiatric hospital, worked as a general practitioner, uh, and then finally made my way here as a, a team and leadership development facilitator. Over the past six, seven years, been able to kind of work my way through the system, and, and now I have the privilege of, of being both a coach alongside Chris here. Thanks for the inspiration and the challenge along <laughs> the way. And, uh, and also get to serve as the manager of programming for our Windshape Teams uh, department. So fun stuff. It's been a, a blast in the journey, and, and it's just an exciting time, I think, in our, our history as we're rolling out and discovering these, these new opportunities to serve. Yeah. Well, before we move on to kind of why coaching, we hear a little bit more of y'all's stories in that. What is one thing from each of you that you have found surprising that you've learned about yourself during uh, the isolation season that we find ourselves in? Patience <laughs> is a big thing for me. Uh, I, I typically am a pretty even-keeled person, uh, but being at home all the time and, are, and just around family and kids and, and really trying to navigate uh, my son just wanting to always be around me and having a team that's going through massive change as well as we're kind of discovering what the new normal looks like. Uh, the Lord has uh, definitely been teaching me patience, <laughs> um, how to be gracious and merciful to myself and hopefully lead well and consistently uh, for my team. I mean, it's just been such a, a learning process, but if I had to boil it down to one, it's been a, an exercise of learning patience. I'd have to say for me, it's just something that I've been on a journey for for quite some time, and that's just the ability to express and be more empathetic. Mm. And not just empathetic in here, like, okay, I can see it from your perspective, but empathetic from a perspective where I'm communicating, yes, I've heard you and I understand you. And that's just been, you go from not being home for 50, 60 hours a week to being home all the time. It, it, it's an adjustment and yeah. it can be rather radical. Yeah. Mm -hmm. I get that. A lot of uh, half finished projects in mm -hmm. our house were well intentioned and then life happens and then it's like, okay, we'll get to that. Sorry. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> so. Really appreciate you guys talking a little bit more and letting us know a little bit more about each one of you. Now, let's kind of move into coaching itself. So why coaching? And what was that kind of catalytic moment for each one of you that said, man, I would love to do this. Mm -hmm. This is really tugging on my heartstrings in that arena of we get to serve folks and we get to serve them well. Yeah. So for Windshape Teams, why coaching? I'd say there's, there's a couple things. One, 
it's just our own personal experience. Myself, Chris, uh, a lot of the leadership team, both past and present, have been through coaching themselves or are currently engaged with coaches. And so we've had the opportunity to reap the benefits of having someone come alongside us and, and ask probing questions, provide meaningful space to wrestle and think through some of the challenging issues that we've faced along the way, whether it be how to lead, team, or follow, and what the implications of these decisions are on our business. It's just been very helpful for us. So personal experience is a big catalyst for that. I'd say, too, just alignment with our mission as an organization we seek to build strong, healthy, fulfilling teams that change the world around them. And those teams are made up of individuals. And those leaders are individuals. And so the opportunity that a coach has to co is to come alongside in a one-on-one, -on -one, in-depth relationship and help move, guide, hold accountable, push, challenge someone towards full, whole, healthy leadership, teamsmanship, followership. And they can lead out of that, that abundance. And then finally, we, we finally have the right people in place, I think. Chris, with your experience and background and your passion for coaching really being a catalyst to that. Teddy, with your history coming on board and providing your perspective and scope and me stepping into that from the, the counseling world, kind of the, the combination of a lot of different perspectives and experience and many folks behind the scenes to support that has really led to this moment to say, hey, I, I think we can step into that world based on wind-shaped teams, 30 years of experience, and our own personal journeys as well. So it also just personally aligns with my, my own mission, what I do myself in my life, and my personal mission statement of, of leading others to deeper self-understanding, empowered decision-making, and purposeful living for the sake of their joy and God's glory. And man, that's, that's coaching to a T, I think, at least from my perspective. How about you, Chris? I think for me, it... Uh it really came to light when I was in that phase of recovering from the surgeries and I was introduced to an emotional intelligence assessment by a professional coach, Dr. Kathy Greenberg, and the CEO of Multi Health Systems who owns that particular assessment. And on a phone call with them, them coaching me through what my emotional intelligence is, you know, what I assessed it to be through that assessment. And then really going home to my girls and saying, hey, you know, this assessment says I don't have a you know, my, my empathy is a bit low. I think I've got plenty of empathy and them both looking at me and kind of laughing and saying, um, maybe not so much. And then that kind of brought it to fruition at, at how useful or helpful that could be, which led into me experimenting and seeking out a uh, level of coaching, formal coaching, because I was looking at it from a perspective of the SEAL teams they do very good at the tactical, the operational, and even the strategic, but some of those leadership skills like relationship building and emotional pieces, maybe not so much. And I know from being overseas in Pakistan after we had dispatched bin Laden that having some emotional intelligence would have helped work with the diplomatic corps that was over there because they have a different culture than I had from being in the military. Mm -hmm. And it became very apparent that that would have been helpful to have that elevated. So I went and got formal coaching, but then brought that back into the community and realized that we could assess our operators early and often and then employ some of our more senior leadership to be coaches formally trained in how to use those assessments to be more effective, not only within the platform of being a special operator, but in their home lives, with each other, and just outside the organization as a whole. So I, that's when I fell in love with it, became board certified, and realized just it was really what I've been doing my entire career with others and seeking to help others grow and become better. So it was just a natural fit for me to take, you know, speaking of life purposes, the time, talent, skills, and experiences I've been blessed with to come alongside others to serve and help them on their journeys to significance in his kingdom. So it's what I can do. That's why I find wind shapes so fulfilling. I get to do that on a daily basis. They say, if you find something, now don't tell him, you do it for free do that because that's how fulfilling it is for me to be here and to be able to pour into others. I mean, each morning in quiet time, I'm thankful for the opportunity to come alongside others and pour into them from the time, talents, and experiences that I've, you know, I've had. So hearing a little bit more of why coaching for each one of you and a little bit of the understanding of where it comes from, um, 
you know, who would benefit from Windshake Teams coaching? Where is that kind of sweet spot for us that differentiates us from the executive coaches, from the 25-year-old life coaches, from all these individuals who uh, that is their title? How do we differentiate ourselves in a space that feels uh, full right now? <laughs> yeah, yeah. Go for it. I think, you know, the, the strongest premise that we have here, and we, we spoke to somebody about consulting some time ago and coaching, and his big thing was find your niche and then grow from that. And I think our niche is that servant leadership, teamsmanship, and followership. So the cornerstone of our coaching is really framed from a perspective, a, a leadership perspective of servant leadership. And we can take that and anchor everything that we do to that, and then we couple that with a level of self-awareness. Those two are a very powerful combination. In fact, there are a lot of threads between self-awareness and uh, servant leadership and Galatians 5.23, the, the fruit of our spirit. And when we thread those together, it truly is kind of a, a cornerstone that we can actually coach from. Yeah. We, we summarize servant leadership in many of our conversations and, and experiences as a, a servant leader is someone that's compelled by the unshakable desire to enrich the lives of others. And so we're starting with this premise in desiring to be servant leaders in a servant-led organization and servant-led coaches of asking ourselves, you know, what does is, what is coaching look like as we seek to enrich the lives of others? So as we sat down and talked about it, we really were looking at what's the, the combination of our, our passions, our giftings, and what we believe the Lord has equipped us with, and the needs that we see in the world that are around us that we can speak to. And I think that, that we kind of walked away with four key areas that we're basing our coaching off of. One of those is, is servant leadership. And how do we develop and equip those individuals to go and enrich the lives of those that are around them? Again, whether that's families, <laughs> whether that's uh, communities, whether that's the careers that they're in, teams that they're on, you name that context. What does it look like to practically equip someone to enrich the lives of others as a leader, team member, or a follower? So we desire to come alongside those others and help support that. Three other kind of pillars, if you will, are, are things like this idea of life planning. So breaking down our month, <laughs> our week, our days and going, how am I structuring my life? What are the decisions that I'm making, the very practical decisions that I'm making, and where are they getting me? What's the direction that I'm heading in, and how do I organize my life in a meaningful and constructive way? That's done in light of kind of two other pieces I think that I'll let you speak to. One of those is this legacy point of view, something that we, we work through in some of our programs and, and walk through others in our coaching. And the other one is, is this emotional intelligence piece, which is just so broadly applicable uh, in so many different realms. But Chris, I'd love for you to speak a little bit more in depth on what those are. Well, we've, we've come to discover this, this concept of a, a, a legacy point of view. And it involves kind of looking where you've been, where are you at, and then where are you going. The reality and what the realization for a lot of folks that have been through that is, is that regardless, we're creating a legacy. And nobody really kind of puts legacy into thought until maybe towards the latter part of our lives, maybe even the end. But the reality is we've been building it the entire time. We can either let the legacy happen kind of like change, we can either let it happen to us and then react to it, or we can be a lot more intentional and we can lead through that change and affect the future and create the change that we would like. Same thing with a legacy. We can choose to lead towards the legacy that we want. We're going to leave the person in the mirror to that destination so that when it's our time to leave this, this big, big ball called earth, we can actually be confident that we're leaving the legacy. We didn't leave anything on the table. We, we, we pretty much used life to its fullest and its deepest to add value to others. And how do we do that in a way that has got intentionality and awareness to it? And that's a lot of what that legacy point of view does for us. It's values creating and being able to make good decision based off of a core set of values. It's looking at the past, building a picture of the future. If I were to pass next year, can I go to that destination and look back and say, yeah, that's, I left a a solid legacy for those behind me. If I left tomorrow, would I be happy with the legacy I have now? Hmm. If the question's not yes, then 
why not, and then what do I do about it? And that legacy point of view perspective, it, it really builds on that and gives people a level of focus and a destination to move towards. And then the emotional intelligence piece, that really ties into the overall self-awareness. And we use a couple of different assessments to, to build on that, but there's this idea of knowing our preferences and our priorities, but then with the EQ piece, it's how do I then show up with those preferences and priorities? And then how do I move forward in them as I receive other people's information? How do I couple that with mine and then lead more effectively? So emotional intelligence, you know, that's what we're going to be doing over this, uh, the remainder of this session and the subsequent four sessions. So let's, let's jump into that. What is emotional intelligence? I think that feels very buzzwordy uh, right now. Um, let's make it Teddy proof or idiot proof, as I like to say. Break it down to its simplicity of what it is and why is it so important, especially in a coaching relationship? Well, it's not only important in a coaching relationship, the idea of EQ or our emotional quotient, as Jesse alluded to, we have many different spheres of influence that we have, family, work, friends, church, softball team, whatever it is. And within each of those spheres, we have many roles. Emotional intelligence plays a key part in all of those. And Jesse will talk about some of the benefits of emotional intelligence, but when we think, you know, deck plate level, at Teddy proof, as you say, is, is that Emotional intelligence is a set of emotional and social skills that we use to be able to appropriately perceive and express ourselves, maintain and build and develop strong, healthy relationships, cope with challenges, and then just be able to use emotional information in, a, in an effective way. And it's not manipulation or anything like that. It's just understanding that if you step into a very volatile situation, you have the ability to recognize it is for what it is, and then be able to make the proper dial adjustments left or right so that everybody feels well about that particular situation and you can lead through it more appropriately. Jesse, thoughts? Yeah, I, I, you may have heard the, the phrase or the quote, wherever you go, there you are. <laughs> I mean, yes, of course. And emotional intelligence deals with that. Wherever you are, <laughs> there you are and you're reacting and you're responding and you're taking in information and it affects your mindsets, it affects the emotions that you exhibit and display and feel along the way. And emotional intelligence is all about how do I navigate that? I love the verse, uh, 1 Thessalonians 4.4, 4, know your vessel so that you can navigate it with dignity and honor. That's in essence what emotional intelligence is getting at. How do you navigate yourself with dignity and honor? so that, hopefully, at the very end, <laughs> you are enriching the lives of those that are around you. You're serving others really well. To like even just bare bones of what emotional intelligence is, because it's, it is a very complex topic. It deals with the psychology of you. It deals with your temperament. It deals with the social things that are going on in, in the life around you, the relationships that you have. It deals with your beliefs and how you respond when those beliefs are challenged. It's, again, a very complex and deep topic. On the bare bones, it's four things. It is your self-awareness. Um, summarizing Daniel Goldman, who wrote a book on emotional intelligence in the 1980s. Uh, know yourself. And then control yourself. Manage those emotions. Understand what you are, what you have. Manage that. Control that. And then it's that social intelligence piece. Know others. Be aware of who is around you, what's going on, the relational components and needs that other people have, and then serve others. That's our, kind of our phrasing. Based on what I know about myself, how I'm controlling and managing myself, based on what I see in the world around me and those that are going, uh, the relationships that I have with the others, what can I do now to step into that into a meaningful, servant-hearted way with a desire to enrich others? And that's basically what we're going to be covering the next four sessions is just looking a little bit more in depth around each one of those topics and saying, what is the practical application? What's just a nugget from the depth of this topic of knowing yourself? What's just a nugget that we can take and apply now to help us grow, to help us seek to understand, <laughs> to help us listen to hear and respond appropriately in the world that's around us with whatever's going on in any situation? 
understanding that this is a complex issue and it's never as simplistic as <laughs> we desire it to be. Yeah. Um, if you could break it down to and finish this statement, an emotionally intelligent person is blank. How would you respond to that? Hmm. The, I think <laughs> an emotionally intelligent person displays the fruit of the spirit. Okay. They're loving, kind, gentle, patient, faithful, self-controlled. Like you, you see and experience that from someone who has emotional intelligence and seeks to grow in that. Uh, there are so many people over the course of my life where I've come across them and crossed paths and been, man, they're just an oasis of peace. They're an oasis of kindness and care. They don't get flustered. They don't get rattled. They're not just reacting to everything that goes on around them. They help bring peace to me and perspective. Uh, and so I'd say an emotionally intelligent person, uh, at least initially, is there someone that embodies and seeks to embody the fruit of the Spirit? And I would take that same definition and use that, but he already did. <laughs> so, <laughs> I stole it. I, and I think the scientific <laughs> term is ditto. Yeah, I think that's what but it is. But I'm going to move past ditto, and I'm going to sure. say a emotionally intelligent person, because if we look at the leaders, the the, the most effective coaches we've ever experienced, the most effective leaders that are out there, they have this innate emotional intelligence about them and they have the ability to use that in such a way that they draw people in. They attract and pull people in towards them. And what they really do is, is, is that without knowing it or realizing it or in some in, intentional spaces, they draw out of people much more than they would ever get from just themselves. A good coach is going to reach into somebody and help them discover their true potential at a much higher level. Hmm. So when we, we talk about coaches and emotional intelligence, but specifically somebody who has a high level of emotional intelligence, people gravitate toward them. I think everybody can actually stop for a moment and think about somebody that was emotionally intelligent and had good empathy and had a good awareness and sought to improve others and, and just had a good, healthy emotional intelligence they would find that they were probably drawn to them in a unique kind of way. They just pull people in. You know, people that are, have blind spots tend to push people away. But people that are emotionally intelligent and very self-aware and use that well will pull people in and pull people together in community. Mm. That's a great point. And I would echo that both of you are an oasis of peace and individuals who pull people in. You have a very trusting uh, aura about you where people want to tell you their stories because you guys have that. So um, thank you for telling us your stories. Thank mm -hmm. you so much for um, educating us and making it Teddy proof. I appreciate <laughs> that. Um, so over the next several weeks uh, at Thursday at 3 p.m. Eastern, you can come back here and we are going to follow this up with more information on EQ and how that can best be utilized in your day to day. Uh, so our moderators have been uh, viewing our chat. Uh, and so we have some questions on that. Uh, one of the questions that I'm actually going to jump in first and ask is, um, we've gotten to know a little bit more about the two of you. So who is a character in literature, film, modern culture, who you find yourself gravitating towards of like, hey, I wish I was this person. And then who's a character who you're like, oh, but this is actually who I am. <laughs> Fictional or? or uh, you can yeah. say anybody okay. except Jesus. Except for yep. Jesus. Okay. Okay. I mean, aspirationally. Of course. Okay. Yeah. I'll go ahead and share, share one of like, hey, I, I desire to be like this. I was watching um, uh, uh, just an online class uh, that Doris Kearns Goodwin Jr. Jr.? No, Doris Kearns Goodwin. Uh, author, historian, was writing, uh, speaking about, she was talking about Abraham Lincoln. And man, what an emotionally intelligent guy and, and just the, the power that he had to sustain, maintain, maintain and, and be a, a life-giving person throughout, man, all that uh, he experienced. And particular story that she was sharing of whenever he would experience a, a frustrating interaction or being challenged by political rivals or anything like that, he'd go back to his office, he, he'd write what, he, what was called a, a hot take, just a letter to that person that vented everything, <laughs> and then he'd take that and he'd put it in a drawer um, and just that, release kind of that emotional tension that he was feeling. And I was like, man, the presence of mind to not just react 
at the drop of a hat to frustrations that are going on, but be able to go back and process through what's happened, what's going on, and, and then <laughs> put that aside and, and then respond appropriately uh, was just hugely inspirational to me. So him and uh, I'll say Gandalf from Lord of the Rings. Okay. Uh, yeah, there we go. <laughs> So I, I'm mixing up all my characters between movies right now. Mm -hmm. um, you know, I think Elmer Fudd. Uh, no, not no. Elmer Fudd. Okay. And then, you know, I'll, I'll move past that. <laughs> I, I think the one I would like to strive to be the most like would be um, Return of the King. Who's the king? Aragorn. Aragorn. Oh yeah. Um, probably have the skills of Langolas. Sure. But feel oftentimes a lot like Roddy Dangerfield. Yeah. <laughs> so I'll, I'll, I'll go with that for now. <laughs> It's, it's funny how everybody mentioned Lord of the Rings and Tolkien's writing because uh, for me, it's Sam. Mm. You know, I've, I've, I have this a desire to just be that ultimate champion for folks and Sam is, is that and he bears the burden at times. And then who I actually am is I'm Hagrid from Harry Potter because, I mean, look at me. <laughs> Why not? Uh, so, uh, so question from the chat. Um, what is a recent book that you are reading to grow in either your knowledge, understanding, or um, just how to best improve your EQ? Interesting, because the book I'm reading right now is called The EQ Shinobi. And the author makes the comparison of being a coach with emotional intelligence and kind of the process of a samurai warrior and the things they had to do to be able to be as effective and expert as they were. And I think the one thing that I've gotten out of it so far, I'm only about halfway through it, is, is that this concept of having an awareness of your EQ identity, and that's kind of coming from like a self-assessment, but then coupling that with your EQ reputation with your different roles and spheres of influence. Like we may think, like I thought I had great empathy, but when I went to my family sphere, realized that maybe not so much and I've got work to do in that particular area. So this idea of understanding that different peer groups or maybe my boss or direct reports will have, I'll have a different EQ reputation with each of those, and how do I make micro adjustments for macro impact to really be more effective and be who he has designed me to be for them is really, you know, how do I build a better me for them? Yeah. And, than letting me serve them. So it's been a very fascinating book to kind of put it into that kind of perspective of EQ identity versus the uh, EQ reputation. Hmm. Yeah. I actually just finished uh, a couple of days ago a biography, surprise, surprise, another one, um, on U Ulysses S. Grant, uh, general in the Civil War and president during the whole Reconstruction phase. Um, and so it's been a, a fascinating read from one, just a leadership perspective but two, just given the current uh, climate and environment and, and all the issues that are really being made known <laughs> in a very powerful way uh, in the world around us, that read has really given me a lot of context for some of the, the hurts and wounds and challenges that a lot of people are experiencing and have experienced for, for hundreds of years. Um, and so I'd say one, just reading that history uh, has helped develop an awareness, both self-awareness and awareness of others that has really evoked uh, a lot of um, sorrow and care and, again, desire to be more self-aware in just m many different contexts that I haven't necessarily had at top of mind as of now or until now. So, sure. So another question to kind of look into a little bit more mm -hmm. is at, when we talk about emotional intelligence, you know, can you provide an example of a successful situation of applying EQ in your life? You mentioned even the empathy with your, your girls of, Hey, I think I'm a, um, I'm an empathetic person, right? And they kind of snicker and they're like, yeah, how do you want us to respond to this? <laughs> um, you know, where have you seen that been most effective? Has it been friends? Has it been family? Has it been work? Has it just been a combination? Can you give us an example? Mm -hmm. I think for me, it, my original foray into EQ as an executive officer of a command, so you're number two in, in command of about 60 different people in this case, civilians, contractors, junior sailors, and senior officers all coming together for a particular mission. And 
what I had realized through the emotional intelligence assessment is, is that given my drive and social responsibility and self-actualization, I had a desire to feed the machine and answer the CEO's call, but didn't realize I was running over everybody to get that to happen. Mm. Going into meetings and I had trained my staff not to come to meetings prepared because they knew I was going to tell them what to do, when to do, how to do it. When I realized that that's what I was doing, and there were many ways to get to Z. A to Z is just a start point and an end point, but there's lots of ways to do that. Mine isn't the only one. The EQ piece was, okay, so how do I affect my emotional intelligence in a way, show empathy, build relationships, reflective listening, using skills and things we'll talk about in the next few uh, series, that abled, enabled me in the moment to connect with them in a way and then turn the command on a dime and then challenge them to do the voodoo that I knew they could do. Basically, I got quiet. I used reflective listening, cleaned off my desk, turned off my computer monitors so people didn't come in and I continued working while they were trying to talk to me, being emotionally present and present. So I was present there, but I was eye to eye and actually discerning what they were saying to me. Freaked my sailors out a couple of times when they first started doing, I was doing that with them, but they got the, they got the message that I was there for them. And then I was like, wow, this is working pretty good at work. I wonder what it would look like at home. So I kind of took it home and just started trying to build that relationship and, and be more emotive at what was happening in here rather than just kind of the, the poker face most of the time. And the relationship with my daughter improved, the relationship with my wife improved. It was just kind of a eureka aha moment going, okay, I really wish I'd have found this about 10 years ago because I just did, I was unaware. I didn't know, I didn't have that. And then in doing that, it was, it's just been, it's why I'm so passionate about EQ today is because I know the impact that it can have on somebody's whole life, not just a sliver of it, but its entirety. I couldn't tell that you were passionate about it, so I appreciate it. <laughs> Just checking. You, I mean, you I putting that out there. Add that Jesse, yeah. you got a quick example? <laughs> yeah. It's, uh, Chris and I are kind of on different ends of the spectrum where, you know, I know we've had conversations and you've been the, the ready, fire, aim kind of guy, like charge in, get, get things done, tell folks what to do. Uh, for me, naturally, I'm on the other side of the spectrum where I may have, in my history, been overly empathetic or overly accommodating and not speak up. Uh, not be decisive, not be uh, assertive in things that would be beneficial for me or for others to speak up about. So a lot of my EQ journey has been giving myself a voice, <laughs> uh, empowering myself to be able to speak up. I mean, a simple example in the, in, in the work world, the kind of present world, is just public speaking. I hate it. I don't like it. I get nervous every time. I actively avoided it and at times lied, cheated, and, and avoided things like college uh, assignments to avoid public speaking. I hate to admit that now. But that was how afraid I was we are live. of it. Yes, we are. <laughs> um, that's how afraid I was of it. But the awareness that grew and the, the, um, of what that fear actually was and the confidence that I had in my, my voice to speak and the willingness to lean in courageously to those fearful moments and those opportunities really has helped me navigate my own emotional reactions anytime that I go in front of people. And I do it often now. Um, and hopefully with confidence and to some level of effect. So just on a very personal level, coming from, from fear and timidity to confidence and boldness uh, in the public speaking realm has been a an EQ journey for me. Yeah. So w one more question. Uh, are there any connections or correlation between your dis style or your um, insert plethora of personality <laughs> style uh, assessments and your EQ evaluation of yourself? Yes, DISC, I am an SC, and uh, in all assessments that I've ever taken on the introverted, extroverted scale, I am 100% introvert, which in part explains the uh, fear of public speaking thing. Uh, so how that shows up on my EQ, a lot of my strengths and weaknesses are kind of two sides of the same coin. For the introvert in general, I process internally. I think deeply. I absorb lots of information before... I speak or before I want to speak up. And man, the EQ kind of showed that to where, man, there are times when I may be too silent. <laughs> Again, too 
uh, in the background of things and not speak up boldly when I need to. Uh, so just personal style behaviorally that DISC shows uh, definitely pointed out the fact that like, man, here, here's some general strengths and weaknesses that you have. And I, man, I saw that play out in, in leadership and in life with my, my wife and son. And it's just a consistent theme throughout of strengths and, <laughs> and growth areas. I think for me being an extreme DC, like almost touching the edge of the disc circumplex, being to that side, now I'm naturally an introvert, but it says I'm a little bit of an extrovert, so I think I'm a functioning introvert, mm -hmm. if you will. But in that, it's very results oriented. The other side of the spectrum where my empathy and interpersonal relationships and emotional expression and all the things you need for deep, fulfilling relationships scores a lot lower and I need to be intentional about elevating the relationships to the level of the task because being so results oriented, you know, you need both results and people. Without results, you don't need the people, but without the people, you can't get the results. Right. So for me and my DISC and my EQ, the, the correlation is there, definitely. There is, a, there is misalignment in that because I'm so extreme on the results side that when I look at my emotional intelligence assessment, yeah, there are some threads there that I can use as data points for improvement mm. or growth. Growth, improvement, any mm. sort of synonyms are great <laughs> right there. Uh, so gentlemen, Dr. Chris Auger, Jesse Parrish, thank you so much for your time today. Uh, groovy people of the internet, we will be doing this again uh, this time next week, Thursday at 3 p.m. Eastern, where we will be diving a little bit more into EQ and how to best uh, utilize it in your life. So thank you for joining us. If you have any questions, our moderators are still in the chat. Um, and we can be found at Windshape Teams. You can Google just Windshape Teams Coaching, and it'll direct you right to our coaching page. So thank you very much, and hope you have a great rest of your day. <laughs>